All right, everyone. So this is James Wilson with MTB Strength Training Systems and BikeJames.com, and welcome to another Bike James podcast. Today, I am joined by Brian McLaughlin. Is that, did I say that right? Yes, that's close enough. Uh, Brian close. McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so all right on. Well, I'll just stick to Brian. So, uh, so cool. So Brian is um, with Mountain Man Medical, and I'm having him on the podcast today to talk about a subject that I don't think gets discussed nearly enough in the mountain biking world. And that is just some basic uh, medical considerations and, and skills and tools that you can have to uh, help yourself or someone else in the event of a traumatic injury situation. And so I'm really excited to get Brian on today to discuss that. So uh, thanks for joining us today, Brian. Um, yeah. So why don't we start out with a little bit about your background? Just tell us about yourself, how you got to, uh, you know, where you are today with Mountain Man Medical, and then we can dive into some specific stuff from there. Yeah. So, uh, well, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I'm the director of medical training out over at Mountain Man Medical. And um, I've been in the medical field uh, ever since when I was in the military. I uh, was a corpsman, which is kind of like a medic for the Marine Corps. Um, so I spent some uh, time in Afghanistan doing uh, tactical medicine and that kind of stuff. A lot of outdoor medicine, of course. Um, and then I grew up hunting and fishing and camping and uh, doing all sorts of outdoor stuff. So that just kind of transferred across. So it, my bread and butter tends to be tactical medicine, um, but especially like wilderness medicine, outdoor type of stuff, um, uh, fixing boo-boos and keeping people alive until uh, we can get them to a higher echelon of care. So I spent some time in the ER working um, as a tech and an EMT and a bunch of other things. Had a uh, company for a little while teaching uh active shooter medicine and that kind of stuff. So um, tactical medicine tends to be my bread and butter. I, I enjoy that the most, but a lot of it is very uh, transferable um, to a lot of the uh, different uh, professions and hobbies that I tend to be interested in. So it works out pretty good for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, um, like I was telling you before the podcast, I actually came across you and got into this through uh, uh, an, an interest in defensive gun use and kind of expanding my self-defense skills and, you know, getting into that world and learning about the medical side of things. And, and, but immediately I saw, so that was my first exposure was kind of the tactical side of medicine, if you will, or the, or the medical stuff. And then, but I immediately saw the transfer, like, you know, the, the principles behind it are going to be the same, whether you're treating someone who's gotten, you know, stabbed or shot or, or something like that, or, you're treating someone who's got a puncture wound of some sort on the trail or, or is, is broken an arm or, or something. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Like there's, there's a ton of crossover between the two worlds. I'm excited to get you on and, and uh, be able to kind of share some stuff with an audience that isn't necessarily exposed to this stuff quite as much, which kind of leads me to my second, uh, uh, I guess, question, if you will, about what you do. And that is mountain man medical specifically, because I really like your guys's uh, mission and so, you know, why don't you go ahead and, you know, share that, like what your, you know, kind of what your, your mission is with Mountain Man Medical and, and goal with it. Oh, yes. Well, my personal goal is to try to get as many trauma kits in other people's hands as possible and try to get them trained up on how to use it. Um, we have a, I put together a lot of very good trauma kits for different types of situations and that kind of stuff based on my own experience. And I want to stock those kits with the best possible equipment, um, the things that I know work for my own personal experience. And then I'm also reading a lot of medical journals and staying up to date on all of the new data that's coming out so that we're uh, approaching trauma medicine in the best possible way. Um, trauma kits don't tend to, people don't want to buy them because they, they can be kind of expensive. Um, but when you are paying out, you know, $30 for a tourniquet, you know, to save your own life and that kind of thing, that seems like a cheap deal for me. Yeah. Um, so having that kind of, um, that's my personal mission is to try to get a, uh, as many trauma kits into other hands as possible and get people trained up in how to use them. Um, it's easy to keep someone alive. Um, it's not that big of a deal. Um, they let people like me do it. Anybody can do it. Right. So like, that's what I'm always trying to tell people is that it seems complicated and it is stressful because it's an emergency situation and someone's in trouble. Um, but the techniques that you need to learn, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to, uh, to be able to help somebody in a bad time. 
Yeah, man, that's a really good point. And again, something I think that's important for people to, to realize is that they're not trying to become an emergency room doctor mm -hmm. or a trauma surgeon. It's like you're just you're there a few basic skills to kind of stabilize someone long enough to let the real help arrive or, or get them to the real help is all you're trying to do. Right. And so don't like don't overcomplicate it or overthink what you're what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to do with this training. And I think that kind of takes some of the intimidation factor away. You know, they, they think if they're trying to become doctors or something, excuse me, it can be a little uh, <clears throat> a little daunting. So um, but that leads me to the uh, uh, the training side. I, I like I said, I, I think starting with that is a good uh, place to start because you guys have some really good training. I've done the. Uh, the video series you have specifically on, on the March algorithm, awesome, which is what I want to dive into because I, I found it extremely helpful. I uh, definitely highly recommend it, but most people aren't really familiar with what the March algorithm is. And I know that I wasn't, you know, I've done CPR, I've done some, some basic first aid classes, but I'd never really heard of, of the March algorithm. And so, but I think it's a good place to start because, you know, once you explain it, then people can start to see like, Oh, well, I might have to, address this on the trail through, uh, through something. And so, uh, I guess like, you know, what is the March algorithm and, and if you could, uh, just, you know, break it down, like what, what, uh, what does it stand for? How does it help people in a, in an emergency situation? Okay. Yeah, no problem. So the March algorithm is something that I learned in the military and it's something that's kind of, uh, transferred across to the civilian world. It's kind of more of the, the common way of thinking for medics, and it's just a way to kind of keep you on task and, and paying attention to the most important things first. A lot of times, especially with um, people that aren't uh, used to trauma very much, they'll start working on the first injury that they see, or even the one that looks the nastiest. You know, um, if um, someone has an evisceration, um, that's a bad day for everybody, but it's not something that you need to concentrate on first, right? So the March algorithm is a way of, keeping yourself on task and paying attention to the most important things first, but it also gives you a vehicle for you to continue on and making sure that you're addressing all of the things that might, um, might hurt somebody long-term and, you know, potentially kill them. So M, <clears throat> so the March M A R C H. Um, and that's what we use. There's a couple of uh, other terms and things that sometimes people will throw in there like P March P, um, but for our purposes, we're just going to stick just to March and M starts, starts with massive bleeding. That's first on the list because that's the most important thing to take care of first. That's what's going to kill your casualty the quickest. So you want to look your casualty over and see if they have any massive bleeding coming from anywhere on their body. And you need to address that. Um, the first way that we're going to address that is with a tourniquet. Uh, if they have that injury, that life-threatening bleeding is coming from an extremity, an arm or a leg, that's where we're going to apply our tourniquets. Um, we're going to control the bleeding with that first. And if that doesn't uh, work, if the wound is in a different place, like a junctional wound, and a junction is anywhere that two body parts come together, like your neck, in your armpit, or in your groin. And you can't apply a tourniquet to that, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it's not going to work. So you have to learn wound packing as well. And you had already talked a little bit about uh, the emergency trauma response course that we have on the Mount Man Medical website. Mm -hmm. And um, that will go over any of these things. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, or your listeners are interested in like brushing up on that kind of stuff, it's completely free. It only takes like an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes or so. And, um, and you'll be able to use all of the items in your trauma kit and give you a brief, good understanding of how all that works. So, um, so we start with M. M is for massive bleeding. A, we get into airway. We want to make sure that they've got a clear airway and they can be able to breathe in and out. Um, the most important thing is oxygen when it comes to a trauma patient. So being able to make sure that one, they've got blood in their body to move that oxygen around their body. But then we also have a clear and patent airway for that air to enter into, uh, into the casualty. And you might see a compromise in that especially with mountain biking injuries. If somebody falls off their bike, go on a high rate of speed, they smash up their face. They might be not be able to um, breathe adequately. So we want to make sure that we can get an open airway for that oxygen and good flow. Um, so we got M massive 
bleeding. A is airway. R is respirations. So that's where we're going to be applying our uh, chest seals and that kind of stuff. If they have a penetrating trauma to the chest, say someone impacts a tree and they take a stick right to that, uh, right to their chest, you're going to need to be able to take care of that. So this is where we're going to apply our chest seals. And that's lower down on the list from massive bleeding and airway because it takes longer for that to develop into a bad situation. So depending on the size of the wound, it can take around 20 minutes or so for a tension pneumothorax to develop or, or what's called a sucking chest wound. And um, we want to make sure that we can take care of that because we still need that good flow of oxygen in and out of the body. So that's going to help us to maintain um, the casualties breathing. So we got massive air, uh, massive hemorrhaging, airway, respirations. C is for circulation. This is going to be a recheck of the casualty to make sure that you haven't missed anything uh, important. So you're going to, with M, you're going to jump on the most important wounds first, the ones that are just pumping blood out of the body. But with C, we're going to go back through and double check everything that we've done. So if they have a tourniquet in place, we're going to go and check that and make sure it's still controlling the bleeding, wound packing, same thing. We're just going to make sure that everything that we've done is still continuing to work and we haven't missed anything important. Then we're going to get into H. H stands for head injury and hypothermia. Now, head injury is low on the list, even though that can be in a very, very serious wound. It's lower on the list because there's not a lot that you can do for a casualty in a, um, uh, I'm used to saying hostile environment, but in a uh, more rural area, there's not a lot yeah. that you're going to be able to do for that. Um, so we're going to want to try to stabilize the casualty, especially their spine. If they've taken a bad hit to the head, there's a good chance that they've got some uh, trauma to their neck as well. And we need to make sure that we're paying attention to that. But the other part of H is also going to be hypothermia. Anytime that you have a casualty who's lost a lot of blood or has been through a traumatic experience, they will uh, start to become hypothermic. Uh, your blood is responsible for maintaining your temperature quite a bit. And if you don't have a whole lot of blood in your body, your body's not going to be able to maintain that temperature and the body temperature will start to drop. Even if you are in the middle of summer in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, there's a good chance your casualty could become hypothermic. And, what, and that's bad because it starts a uh, coagulation cascade. It just prevents the blood from clotting adequately. So um, it can increase bleeding. So we want to make sure that we're keeping the casualty as warm as possible. So having things in your trauma kit, like a, uh, an emergency blanket, or getting the casualty next to a fire or into the cab of a truck, or just maybe even into the sun where they can uh, warm up a little bit might be, you know, very beneficial and might save their life in the long run. So starting off at the top, we have M for massive hemorrhaging. A is for airway. R is for respirations, C for circulation, and H for head injury or hypothermia. So that's yeah. the March algorithm. Yeah, it's it, it's it's awesome because it does it, uh, sum up like once you go through it, it's like oh yeah, well, that does make sense. Like you do need to address this first and then address that, and and there can be a tendency that if you don't have some sort of uh, you know checklist to to go through to to help you prioritize things that you can just start randomly treating something thinking you're doing a, a, a good job, but not actually addressing the most important thing at that, at that time. And so, you know, there's a difference between helping and, and doing what you want and calling it help. Um, and so that's where, uh, where the training comes in. So I'll, I'll make sure I include a link with this, uh, with the podcast and blog posts and all that to your guys's uh, website and course. Cause yeah, I can't, I, I uh, really uh, can't recommend it enough because you guys did really a great job of going through and explaining and giving practical examples of, of what this, this would look like and what you're going to do and, and what kind of tools you can use to address it. So, uh, but I want to actually ask you a, a question um, about one of the tools that you mentioned, which is tourniquets. And this is something that I, you know, probably uh, if you would have asked me on any given day, I might have gotten the wrong answer. Um, but I still hear this come up from time to time when I bring up tourniquets in the mountain bike community. And that is that if you put a tourniquet on a limb, they're going to lose it. 
Like it's like an ipso facto thing that if you tourniquet a limb for any period of time at all, it, it, they're going to lose it. So you got to weigh that in to whether you're going to put a tourniquet on your buddy's leg because your buddy's going to lose that leg. And so uh, can you speak to that and just kind of clear up, like what are the facts about tourniquet use and, and uh, um, how does that affect the limb and, and stuff like that? So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is like one of those ones that the, the, one of the rumors that just won't die. Right. I mean, this is something that they would they taught not that long ago, you know, 20 plus years ago is something that was pretty standard practice is mm -hmm. that you don't apply that tourniquet until you're 100 percent sure that that person is going to die. Um, and that's gotten a lot of people killed because people are waiting. They're like, well, I don't want this person to lose their leg. That would be very bad. So I'm going to wait to apply this tourniquet. And the entire time that they're waiting, the casualty is just bleeding to death. So um, that used to be something that they taught, especially like in the Boy Scouts and in the military. So it's a rumor that's been around for a very long time. I, and the current research that's been done, there's been a lot of research that's been done, especially with our guys out in Afghanistan and Iraq and that kind of stuff. Um, there are, have been reports of casualties who have had tourniquets in place for up to six hours and them still being able to uh, save the limb. So if you, if you leave the tourniquet for a long, long period of time, then yes, there is a risk that that casualty will lose their, their limb. But fortunately, we live in America where we have very good health care. We have helicopters and ambulances that can whisk that casualty away to uh, the hospital and get taken care of. That's not nearly as big of an issue for us civilians. In the military, you might be trapped in a uh, bad part of Afghanistan and stuck in place for days at a time. Um, so that's where... The, um, it changes quite a bit, but here in America, we don't really have to deal with that. So yeah. the general rule of thumb that I tell people is two hours. So if as long as you're getting the casualty to the hospital within two hours, they're going to be just fine. They're not going to have any problems whatsoever. Um, one of the things that you'll have is when the tourniquet is applied, um, it will slow. You're, you're not getting any oxygen to the tissues um, in your leg or wherever that tourniquet is applied. And so with, without oxygen supplying to the tissues, you will start to get tissue death and nerve damage and that kind of thing. Um, but that's only after um, two hours plus. So if you, if you can get the casualty to the hospital within two hours, then you don't need to, to be so worried. On the other end of things, it doesn't really matter either way. Um, it's preferable to lose a leg over to losing your life. So mm -hmm. applying that tourniquet is, should be your first go-to whenever you see a lot of blood pumping out of the casualty, getting that tourniquet applied as quickly as possible is going to be the most beneficial thing to them. So um, yeah, that's one of those rumors that just won't go away. And uh, it's one of those things that just, um, it, it'll get a lot of people killed. So when in doubt, just apply the tourniquet and call for EMS. If they need to remove it, they'll do that at the hospital and it won't be that big of a deal. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And at the uh, important word that you used there was research, right? There's actual research on this. This isn't just yeah. one person's opinion on it. And so, you know, one of the uh, unfortunate side effects of so much war uh, over the last few decades is that we have had uh, a real world laboratory to find out what does work for saving people. My understanding is, is that, you know, that, that there's been a great benefit to that, that a lot of people now in, in the battlefield who may have died are, are, are surviving because of a better understanding of uh, how to control traumatic bleeding and giving soldiers the correct tools and training to, to do that. I mean, is that, is that the case? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, some of our greatest breakthroughs in medicine have come from war, um, you know, getting rid of things like malaria and yellow fever, you know, and being uh, antibiotics and all these other things that we really, really value um, have come across um, in a large part because governments want to win wars. So they put mm -hmm. a lot of money into researching these things and keeping their soldiers alive so that they can win. 
And that tends to benefit us civilians quite a bit. Um, a lot of uh, our current trauma understanding has come out of Afghanistan and Iraq because we have so many casualties. We get a chance to study so many different cases and experiment with what works and what doesn't. And that, yeah, definitely a lot of stuff comes out of uh, the military when it comes to uh, trauma management. Nice. So I guess kind of uh, picking up on the, the tourniquet there. So now that we've addressed like, you know, it is uh, safe to use um, uh, both short term and just, you know, hey, if you need one, you need one. Um, what would you there's some different kinds of tourniquets. Um, could is there a way for you to just kind of like uh, like broad overview? Like, you know, what are the kind of the, I know there's different like name brands, you know, but it, it, there's a couple of different categories uh, or, you know, a few different categories of tourniquets. And I, I guess just uh, kind of explain um, what those are and, and, you know, what, you know, the pluses and minuses would be. And I guess, you know, for a mountain biker, like, you know, is there one over the other that you would recommend uh, a mountain biker look at, uh, look at carrying? Yeah. So th there's a lot of people that have very strong opinions about which tourniquets that they want and what they don't want. Um, and for me personally, I've used most of the, um, uh, the name brand popular ones that are on the market today. Um, we have the cat tourniquet and the soft T. Um, and those are all very good tourniquets. They tend to be um, geared a lot more towards uh, the military, of course, uh, because that's where this stuff is, has originated. Um, and then they also have things like the rats tourniquet and the SWAT T. So there's a lot of different brands out there and they all have their own uses and benefits. I don't usually prefer one over the other. It kind of depends on what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. The cat tourniquet tends to be one of those that is better for self-application. It's a little bit easier and streamlined. The soft T is my favorite to use on somebody else. Um, but what I would recommend for your um, mountain biking crew is what's called the, the SWAT T. And what this is, is just basically just a rubber exercise band. Mm -hmm. And um, what this does is when you stretch it and wrap it around the, uh, the wound, it provides circumferential pressure and clamps off the artery. One of the benefits is how wide this is. This is a very wide band and it puts pressure over a larger surface area. So what it does is it occludes the artery more quickly and it also is more comfortable. The, the smaller the band, like a lot of people will try to do an improvised tourniquet with like shoelaces or 550 cord or something like right. that. Yeah. Um, and what that is extremely painful um, and you'll cause nerve damage and tissue damage much more easily. So with this wide band of this SWAT T, it puts that pressure over a larger surface area and makes it more comfortable for the casualty. It's still going to be uncomfortable. That's one of the things I like to talk to people about is don't let the casualty talk you into loosening up that tourniquet. Mm, yeah, That'll happen. Yeah, it'll happen all the time. It's painful. They have a medical term for it. It's called tourniquet pain. And uh, what they'll do is they'll give people morphine and, and all sorts of things in the ER um, to take care of them because they're, they cannot remove that tourniquet or the casualty will bleed out. And that's exactly what will happen if you try to release that tourniquet, try to loosen it up to make the casualty a little more comfortable then they're just going to bleed out more slowly. So um, your role as a first responder or a medic or whatever your role is in this situation is to talk the casualty into leaving that tourniquet in place because it's going to save their life. So having something with a wider band like this will be beneficial. The other really good point of these uh, SWAT T tourniquets is that it's a multi-use item. Not mm -hmm. only is this a tourniquet, but you can use it as a pressure dressing. I can run this around Say I've got a hole in my neck. I fell into a tree. I just bust an ass down the hill right into a tree and I take a stick to the neck. And now I need to pack that wound and control that bleeding. But all I have is this. I can whip this out and pack that wound and hold that wound packing in place with just this. Um, mm -hmm. You can use it for a bunch of other things, including tying a knot in the end of it. And you can make yourself a sling. So if you have a shoulder, um, an arm injury of some kind, you can use this as an improvised sling. A bunch of other things that you can use this for. So it's one of those multi-purpose items that I like to have in all of my trauma kits. It's not my favorite tourniquet for um, everything. 
Um, if, if I know I'm going to a really bad situation and there's going to be bleeding people, I'm going to want to have a cat tourniquet and a soft tee. But if I'm just preparing for the off chance that I'm going to get hurt and mm -hmm. I need to save on space and weight, like you might on a mountain bike, I'm going to want to have like at least one SWAT tee in my kit so that I can control that bleeding. And it adds redundancy to my kit. So if I already have a cat tourniquet in my trauma kit and one of these, I have two tourniquets and an option for pressure dressings. So it's just one of those fantastic um, items that um, you, I think everybody should always have in their trauma kit because it adds to the effectiveness of that trauma kit. Yeah. Yeah. I've even heard you mention you can cut a piece off to use as a chest seal yep. uh, if you need. And so, yeah, it really is a, a, a multi-use item that can help, um, you know, potentially on a few, in a few, few different ways. Uh, so yeah, that's, um, uh, good point. I'm glad you, you brought that one up. Cause like I said, I've heard you talk about the utility of that one, uh, before. And I think that's an important thing again, for riders to know that, you know, you know, yeah, you can get a full, uh, IFAC and, and figure out how to shove it into your fanny pack. Like I have, or you can get a couple things that are multi-use that will cover, uh, you know, a few different things. And again, that's just going to make you more prepared than if you had, uh, had nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I guess along with, uh, the, the tourniquet, um, which again, like I, I point out to people, it's funny cause they've carried stuff to, to patch holes in their tires, right. And their tire, the, the rubber tires are infinitely more robust than your skin. And so if there's things on the trail that can punch a hole in your tire, there's things on the trail that can punch a hole in you. <laughs> yeah. And if you're not carrying something to deal with that potentiality, then, but you are carrying something to, to fix a, you know, a flat on your tire, like, you know, it, it's, it's just a little interesting how we're able to, to, uh, uh, you know, ignore obvious things because no one's really pointed them out to us before because again yeah. like i said this isn't this isn't a conversation that gets had much in in the mountain biking world but so along with the tourniquet are there any other uh, uh pieces of equipment that you would recommend that riders consider having um either because you know they provide something you know vital to themselves a single use or again something that's kind of a multi-use piece of equipment uh, or, or tool so um yeah what would you recommend recommendations be there Yes. So, um, I think, you know, having a good tourniquet on you is like one of those essential items. You never know when you're going to have a wound. You just can't control the bleeding. So having the option to be able to take care of something like that quickly and effectively is important. So tourniquets are great, but you also have to be thinking a lot about like, what are the types of wounds that you're most likely to sustain? So lacerations and puncture wounds, that's definitely a possibility, but the thing you're probably going to be seeing much more often, especially in mountain biking, is going to be your fractures. Um, you know, you've fallen off of your bike. Um, I know, you know, you could catch your, your finger or your hand in a rock or a root or something like that as you come off your bike and get, you know, all sorts of fractures all yeah. over the place. There's a pretty common fracture called a foosh. F O O S H fell on outstretched hand. And what that is, is like, just you're falling down the stairs or whatever, and you reach out and you put your hand out to kind of like catch yourself as you fall. Yeah. And then you can get wrist uh, and arm injuries from that particular uh, situation. And if you're coming off of your mountain bike, that's what's going to be happening to you as well. So yeah. you, you want to start making sure that you're preparing for that kind of a thing. And one of the best ways that you can do that is, let me grab it real quick. Yeah, yeah. Man comes prepared. Of course, he's got all the tools right there. We got, this is a, uh, this is a, um, we sell these on the Mountain Man Medical uh, website. And they're basically just a moldable splint. They have uh, padding on the outside and there's a little bit of, um, of uh, metal on the inside that you can kind of shape and form it to the exact size of the casualty and their, their, uh, their limb. Um, there's a couple of different methods for using this. So you, it helps a lot if you know how, um, but this is something that uh, I think would be beneficial. The problem is, is that it's pretty bulky. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have a type of splint um, 
put out by some uh, special forces bubbas at, over at TAC Med Solutions. And um, it's called the Rise Splint. And it's even a little smaller than this, and it might be a little more packable. It's going to be a little difficult to get this into a kit where you're going to be riding down the hill with it. So what I would recommend is that maybe you have a staging point where you have a trauma kit available so that if you do need this, you do need a splinting material, you have that available to you. Um, and somebody can run down the hill and go grab that. Mm -hmm. um, splinting injuries is not something that's emergent. That's pretty far down on the list. You know, um, we're not going to approach that during the March algorithm. We're going to take care of all of the March things first. And then when we get the opportunity, we're going to come back and take a look at that fracture and get that stabilized. Stabilizing a fracture is very important. Um, if you have a uh, broken bone, then that bone needs to be realigned into a position where the casualty is more comfortable. So if their arm or their leg is sitting at an, at a weird angle, we want to take that and gently and very carefully move that back into a more normal alignment. And what that's going to do is it's going to make sure that none of the arteries in there are kinked and mm. blocked off and basically providing a tourniquet with no blood flow to the rest of the limb. So by getting that limb straightened out, we're able to get good blood flow back in. The other problem is when a bone is fractured, the bone breaks in the middle and these ends are very, very sharp. They will cut you like a knife. So um, when they're broken on the inside of your body, they can slash through all of the arteries and tendons and things that are on the inside of your arm, but also push through and out of the skin and become an open fracture. Mm. So um, that can be very dangerous. So if you just leave that arm to flop around, if it's inside of the arm, it's just going to be slashing everything up on the inside. So we want to make sure that we get that very well stabilized and, and um, not moving as much as possible. Um, and the other thing that that's going to do is provide a lot of comfort to the casualty. If you've ever broken a bone, you know that it's very uncomfortable. Um, and one of the things that they've noticed about PTSD is that if they can reduce the amount of pain that the casualty feels, it will also reduce the amount of PTSD that they'll have um, after the event. So mm -hmm. maintaining a good awareness of that is going to be essential for taking good care of your, uh, your casualty. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a good point. Something that, uh, again, people should consider because, you know, just saying there's two kinds of riders out there. Those that have crashed and those that are waiting to crash. Like yeah. that's it. You know, like you're going to crash. If you mountain bike for any length of time, you're going to go down and you're going to go down hard. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I, I mean, I rode for 20 uh, plus years uh, without thinking about this stuff. And I'm out there like charging, like jumping off everything I can find, you know, just and and hit the ground hard. I've, I've popped both the AC joints. I've sacrificed many uh, body parts to the mountain biking gods, some of them twice. <laughs> and just, you know, just pure luck that I didn't ever have something that required uh, a, it was more we created more of a traumatic injury situation. But on, you know, on the flip side, the story that I tell people to kind of drive this home is that I, I knew a guy who was riding along and had his uh, front end wash out on him. And he just happened to puncture his thigh and, and puncture his femoral artery with his handlebars. Whoa. And he's sitting and he uh, luckily he was, you know, like a few hundred feet from the parking lot. And so they were able to get help there. He was able to, you know, stop, you know, staunch the bleeding really like just enough by sticking his thumb in there and they were able to get an ambulance there. So he survived, but he had no way of controlling or stopping that bleeding. And, and for any length of time, really, if he would have been a mile or two out on the trail and that would have happened, he would have been done. And so it can happen, right? Like you, you can be, it, it doesn't matter what kind of riding you're doing. Like this guy was just a, you know, a, a quote unquote normal rider, uh, you know, doing nothing extreme and ends up with his femoral artery punctured by his handlebars. I'm out there, you know, for two decades, like hurling my body off everything I can find and manage to walk away without that. And, and I look like, I'm like, man, I got so lucky. I got so lucky uh, that that, that that was the case, but the, you know, again, people thinking about, man, I may, 
the common things like a, a puncture wound, um, you know, breaking a bone, like these are, are things that you do need to consider. And I, I think that, um, you know, to your point of it being a little bit, uh, you know, the splint being a, a little bit bulky, um, you know, there's, I think riders get too caught up in, in weight and how much, you know, it's like, man, do you want to have like the least amount of weight or do you want to be a little prepared, like grow a little stronger for Christ's sake? Like nobody's getting paid based on their Strava times, you know, like, so like be that one dude in your group who, who, who sacrifices a little bit to carry something so that you could be the person who gets the others home if something freaking bad happens. So right. anyways, just kind of, so, you know, a little bit of a, um, you know, side rant there on, on some of the, the, the way people look at this stuff. But um, so anyways, man, yeah, that, that's a, that, that's a good point. I, I, I think too, uh, something that people don't think about and I, I really kind of dismissed was a, like a solar blanket, a, you know, an illuminized uh, blanket. Um, the, those are actually surprisingly uh, handy to have, especially in light of the March algorithm, something I wouldn't have thought about. And something else that doesn't take up a lot of space is, is, is that something that you would would recommend riders also consider uh, having in their bags is doesn't doesn't seem to take up much space. It seems to have a pretty good uh, value. Extremely light. Yes, absolutely. They're very light. They're um, they're tiny. You can pack a bunch of them. We sell them on the Mountain Man Medical uh, website. Um, it's not the best option out there, but it's good in a pinch. You've got nothing else then mm -hmm. that's, that will be the best option for you to, uh, to take care of them for hypothermia and, um, talking a little bit about like your guy who went down there and punctured his femoral artery and stuck his thumb in there. That's great. That's essentially wound packing is what mm -hmm. he did. He packed the wound with his thumb. And that's something I've heard about fairly often. Someone will take an injury and in desperation, they'll just cram a finger in it or a thumb or whatever the case and control the bleeding that way. So one of the things that you should probably think about, um, um, or your, your other writers is, is like, what do you do without a trauma kit? If you don't have a tourniquet, what do you do? Um, and I'm always trying to get people to uh, think along the lines of direct pressure. If you don't have any medical gear, direct pressure is going to be the most beneficial thing. Um, you want to get a good amount of pressure, especially on something that your femoral artery, it's, there's a lot of tissue in the way your thighs, especially with mountain bikers, right? They're going to have big old thunder <laughs> yeah. thighs, right? You know, cycling up and down those hills. Yeah. So they might have a lot of tissue in place. So if you've got somebody that has big legs like that, then you might need to use two tourniquets. Um, if you have a, uh, a cat tourniquet or a soft tee, um, they have like a 1.5 inch band and you might not get adequate compression of the artery to control that bleeding. So you might need to use two tourniquets. If I, that's one of the things I like to talk to about um, my military members, my special forces guys, you know, they tend to have big legs like that and they might need two tourniquets as well. So if you are one of those individuals that's got big legs, you might want to think about carrying an extra tourniquet. Um, but if you don't have that direct pressure is the most important thing you want to get right on top of the wound. I take the heel of my hand, put both hands over it. Like I'm doing chest compressions. So that way I'm not using my muscles to hold um, that pressure because eventually I'm going to get tired. So using my body weight to control that bleeding with direct pressure is going to be the most important thing that you can do um, to uh, save somebody when you don't have any trauma gear. Um, so um, uh, I forgot where I was going to go with that. Definitely. No, it's fine, man. Yeah, no, it's good. Good advice. You're just kind of talking about like if people didn't have a trauma kit, you know, what, what could they do? I think the, the direct pressure um, is, is, uh, is good advice. Cause again, it, it seems obvious, but you know, knowing that that's the best thing to do and thinking it's the best thing to do aren't necessarily the same thing. And so hearing from someone like you saying like, that is the best thing to do. If you don't have anything else, I think is uh, um, important for people to hear. So uh so I guess um, I, you've mentioned a couple of times that your one of your goals is to get as many trauma kits into as many people's hands as possible. And I guess just kind of expanding out from the mountain bike specific aspects of medical concerns is just the idea of being better prepared in, in general. Um, you know, because I think that's really what when I started, you know, self-defense in general uh, is at its heart is being prepared, 
being prepared in case something happens. And then there's different varying degrees of that, but realizing that that mindset of being prepared, it extends to other areas, including medical concerns. And, and so, and it should also extend to other areas besides just on your bike. And, you know, one of the, the, the things that I tell people, I, I I'm ripping this off. I forget who I heard it from, but it's like, you know, the odds of you needing to use a, a gun aren't very high, but the odds of you coming across someone needing some medical help, like a car accident, uh, or something are, and that's something I don't think a lot of people think about. Um, so I guess just kind of expanding out, like, what, what, you know, what would you recommend people have? And, and I guess like optimally, you know, like, Hey, this is what I would recommend. This is what you have in your home. This is kind of, you know, some things to think about, you know, in your, your car or just like what, what some, some, what would you recommend that people think about on, on a, a larger scale of their, for their life to, to be prepared in case something uh, happens beyond the trail. So hopefully that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, we actually have a trauma kit I put together for the outdoors um, with the intention of like reducing weight and having the most important items available uh, for you to use it. And so this is the the tracker trauma kit. It's kind of a small uh, version and it'll come with, you know, your SWAT T and your other wound packing material. It's got a hemostatic agent in it, like quick clot. Um, and hemostatic is just means it makes the blood clot quicker. Mm -hmm. So if you need to pack a wound, um, you've got a junctional wound or something like that, then the quick clot is pretty beneficial. So tourniquet, wound packing material, a pressure dressing, a way to keep that wound packing material in place. Um, you also have the risk of penetrating trauma to the chest, you know, taking a stick to the chest and that kind of thing. So having some chest seals are going to be important. Um, and then you're going to also want to have um, your uh Cravats. A cravat is basically just a triangular bandage that you mm -hmm. can use to make slings. You can use it to improvise tourniquets. It's just one of those multi-use items. That's another beneficial thing. And then, of course, we already talked about hypothermia prevention, having that, um, uh, that mylar space blanket, the survival blanket in there is going to be beneficial for maintaining uh, your casualty. Um, I think those are the, going to be the things that are going to take care of your casualty the most. Um, and then if you are also to able to have a place where you can pack in your um, moldable splints, that can be a good option for you. But a lot of your guys are going to probably be in the woods somewhere where they should be able to find, you know, some uh, sticks and that kind of thing to make their own uh, splints. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it's just going to kind of come down to um, what kind of training that you have and what you've practiced. It's one thing to know how to do a thing. It's another thing to actually do it. So if you have the opportunity, maybe you ride with a group, pulling those people together and having a little training session about what to do in the case of a broken bone, how to splint it. And that kind of thing might be beneficial for you. Yeah. So I, I would say um, if you're looking to put together your own tracker or your own trauma kit, um, you can head over to mountainmanmedical.com. We sell all the individual components. So if you just want to pick and choose what it is that you want, you can do that. Or you can just pick yourself up a, a nice little kit um, and get that all squared away for you. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the nice thing about that kit uh, is that one, you, you know, the for people watching the, the video here, it's not very big at all. And that's something that can slide into a camelback uh, pretty easily, like getting, you know, a lot of people wear hip uh, packs, um, you know, especially for for shorter rides. Um, and so the it's a little tougher to pack stuff in there. And that's where you may just like you know, have like a SWAT T tourniquet or something like that in there uh, to just have something because, you know, for space considerations. But as soon as you throw on a, a, a backpack, any sort of like camelback type thing that, that's a backpack, like packing something that size in there is not that hard. And it, it doesn't take up a lot of space. It's not, it doesn't weigh a whole lot. And it has a whole lot of utility. And the nice thing too, is that you can then transfer that into your car. It's like I was, you know, mentioning like you may be on the way to work and come across a car accident, be the first one on scene and, and need, need to administer the March algorithm to help somebody there. And well, do you have the tools in your car? And so if you have a, a kit like that, that you're able to, you know, have in your car and, and then throw in your bag when you go on the trail, um, it just helps you be even, even more prepared, uh, which I think is, is, is part of your guys's, uh, 
goal with Mountain Man Medical, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. No, absolutely. And you know what? One of the things that I think quite a bit about is like you know I don't carry a gun to protect myself necessarily, right? Like I'm pretty good at running away. I can run away pretty good, you know, but um, I more carry a gun, you know, to protect my family and other people. And I think trauma kits are a kind of one of those particular things. Like you could get a trauma kit and have it available if you do get injured, but it's more likely that you're going to come across somebody who has been injured. You had already said that, you know, it's much more likely for you to need to use a trauma kit than a gun. And absolutely. Um, there's so many different circumstances and there's different people out there who don't always agree with um, carrying a weapon for self-defense, but everybody can agree that trauma gear is important. And yeah. uh, we get uh, messages all the time from people who have used our trauma kit. And a majority of those tend to be uh, car accidents. So coming up on those car accidents that the uh, cab or the compartment, the passenger compartment can compress and trap limbs and sever arteries and all sorts of things. And that person can bleed out before EMS can get there. So having some trauma gear available for those types of situations are beneficial. So you're not always just going to be using it for yourself. And there's a good chance you won't be, hopefully you won't, but you'll have it there available if somebody else in your party, or even coming across somebody on the trail, who's, you know, taking a bad dive and you're the one there to save their life. I think that's pretty beneficial. Yeah, no, man, there's that, uh, that, that quote kind of gets a little worn out about the, uh, the warrior out of every hundred men in battle, you know, he shouldn't even be there. And, you know, 10 are just targets and nine are fighters, and, <laughs> you know, but one, you know, one is the warrior. And, and the yeah. reason he's the warrior is because he's the one that will bring the others home, right? It's not, he's the one who's going to kill the most bad guys or look the most badass on the field. It's like, he's the one who's going to bring the others home. And it's like, to me, like, that's at the heart of what, you know, this is about is like, are you going to be the one who can bring the others home if something goes wrong? And it's, it's not always about yourself. You know, there, there's bigger things, whether it's your family or your your riding buddies or just the freaking stranger you come across in a car. You know, we're all part of this, you know, the, the same uh, community on some level. And so uh, I think that that's just an important concept and one that I, I think, unfortunately, doesn't get, you know, talked about enough uh, in today's society in general and, and almost kind of, you know, getting a warrior is almost kind of like, you know, toxic masculinity or something like that. And it's like, no, nah, you know, look, some people can take that a little funky, but really at the heart of it, like you said, man, it's like, you, you know, you're doing this to protect your family. You're doing this to protect your friends. I think that that's what it, that people need to consider when they're thinking about this, because it may not be just you, but man, you know, do you want to be sitting there watching your buddy bleed out on the trail and, and just watching them die because you got no tools or no way to help them? Like, I, I got to imagine that's a pretty terrible terrible feeling. So, you know, even that's kind of a selfish concern to just like, man, have yeah. some tools and some training. So yeah, ultimately um, it's all kind of, kind of sounds to selfishness, you know, like I know um, a lot of the firefighters and paramedics and military medics that I know became that because they watched somebody that they know bleed out or they came across something and they're, they didn't know what to do. And that's a horrible feeling. Um, but fortunately it's one that's easily gotten past because the skills are not that difficult. There's just some very, very key details that you need to know to make things like tourniquets effective. You know, having a tourniquet's not enough. You got to know how to use it. Um, and part of that is also your scenario training. I know, um, a big part of my time in the military and being in combat, um, has bled over into my life as a medic where I do a lot of scenario work in my own head. If I'm just bored and I'm sitting in a place and I'm not really thinking about too many things, I'll start running through scenarios in my head. If somebody starts bleeding right now from their left leg, what am I going to do about that? Um, yeah. So running through those types, types of little scenarios while you're out there on the trail, or even um, if you are doing like a safety brief, if you're riding with a group and you have a chance to talk some of this stuff out with the people that are around you, everybody kind of knows the plan about what to do and what their role is, it really is beneficial for uh, getting that person taken care of very quickly and efficiently. So if you go through those types of scenarios in your own mind, then it's something that will just naturally occur. You'll come across this problem and you'll already be working on it without even thinking about it because you've already done it so many times in your head. That's a pretty standard um, 
sports psychology Mm -hmm. is, is going through those types of scenarios. What do I do if, and then you're already doing it because you've done it so many times in your head. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. You don't want the first time that you're trying to apply a tourniquet to be when someone's bleeding out. Right. Uh, you know, you want to have practiced it yourself. Um, I think that's, you know, uh, really important that you actually, uh, take time every month or whatever to pull the tourniquet out and practice applying it to yourself and applying Mm -hmm. it to someone else. And, and then, you know, like you said, uh, imagining like the, the visualization aspect of it and seeing yourself in the situation where you're having to, uh, to help can, can play a big role. It's like, you know, like I tell people, man, visualization plays a big role in hitting the big jump for the first time because yeah. you don't want that first time you hit that jump for real to be the first time in your head, right? Like you, yeah. you want to have hit it a few times in your head and seen yourself being successful before you put yourself under the stress of the moment of, of hitting it uh, for real. And same thing here, like using that visualization uh, power really of the mind to to imagine scenarios like that. I think that's a that's a really good point, something that um, I think that, you know, people can have the tools, but if they don't even watch the videos, right? Like you guys got the, a great video series and, but if you don't practice it and you don't visualize it, it's, it's not going to really pay the dividends that it could if it needed to. So I think that's a, a really good point. Well, I, I completely agree. And I think uh, one of the things, the key things that I really like what you said is like seeing yourself succeed. Um, You know, I've run into people all the time where they'll come up to me and they'll say something like, well, how do you handle all the blood? And at first that really like confused me. I was like, what? Well, you have to, if you don't, someone's going to die. And, and they just looked at me and they like, well, I don't, I don't think I can do that. Like blood really freaks me out. I, I just kind of see myself like falling apart. And, th- and it really kind of struck me like, well, well, what is the difference between me and them? Because I'm just like everybody else. There's nothing special about me. The mm-hmm. only main difference between me and that these, these people that I talk to is that I see myself succeed. Um, I do this visualization process. I think of myself, I go through the scenarios. What do I do if, but while I do that, I see myself being the hero. I see myself coming out on top. And then when it comes time to it, that's just what happens. So seeing yourself succeed, giving yourself, allowing yourself that confidence to know that you've got this. It's not that big of a deal. It's not your emergency. It's somebody else's emergency is uh, one of the things that'll help quite a bit. Nice, man. That's awesome. I think that's a good, good note to, to wrap it up on, man. We've gotten a lot of great information. Um, I do want to, uh, before I let you go, just the, the, the website mountain man medical, um, you know, your, your guys, one of your goals is to get top quality tested, proven equipment into people's hands at a reasonable price. And I think that, that it's important to let people know that uh, just like everything else, where there's money to be made, you will find sub uh, par quality and outright counterfeit mm. products. And again, something I didn't realize, I, mean, I remember uh, it may, may have been a podcast with you that I heard like talking about the, the cat tourniquet and like it having the little red tip. And I didn't know that. And I, I ran around the house and checked all my cat tourniquets like, God damn it. Don't tell me I got taken by some <laughs> freaking Chinese knockoff, but you, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And, and so instead of just like going to Amazon or doing a, you know, a search and trying to find like the cheapest price possible on some of these things that, you know, you guys have really like taken that guests work out like people know when they buy something from you guys that it's it's legit and that it works and it's been proven so i think that's just an important uh point before i let you go to make about mountain man medical and and why people should go and check it out besides just the the great free training um but uh why they should should uh, look at getting some stuff from you guys as well i i appreciate that like um this is like this is a pretty important thing for me. You know, I'm dealing with people's lives here and like, I don't, I could not sleep well at night if I knew I was giving out subpar products and even like over expensive products, you know, like we have the cheapest trauma kit on the market with the quality of gear that we have in there. Like you can't find the gear that we have for as cheap as we sell it. Um, and that was really important to me because one, I want this stuff to be used on people. I want them to save lives with it, but also I don't want 
um, money to be an inhibitor for them to be able to have the gear that they need to save somebody's yeah. life. So it was really important for me to have a product where I could stand behind it and I can feel good about it for myself, knowing that this is the best kit out on the market and the least expensive kit on the market. So I feel pretty confident about that. I'm, I'm very pleased with the products that we have, and I feel like we're doing, you know, our best to um, get more trauma kits into more hands for a good price. We could make a lot more money at this, but we don't because we believe that, uh, you know, more people need more uh, trauma gear, save more lives. Yeah, no, man, I think that's a, a great mission. And again, why I, I like, like your, what you guys are doing and, and wanted to have this podcast in the first place because I wanted to let more people specifically in the mountain biking community know about what a great resource that, uh, that you guys are. And I will say it's a little tough hearing a mountain biker riding an $8,000 bike crying poverty uh, over a $25 <laughs> <Yeah>. tourniquet. <laughs> but, you know, I guess that's how you ride an $8,000 bike is you don't buy, uh, you know, cheap, uh, you know, uh, tourniquets or whatever, but or inexpensive, I guess. Cheap's not yeah. the right word. I remember in the, in the bike shop, we're like, we don't do cheap. We do budget oriented, um, <laughs> which is because it's like, yeah, if you want cheap, you go to Walmart, right? Like that's yeah. what you get. Those are, those are cheap bikes. Like we do budget oriented. Well, I see um, that everywhere, you know, like in the gun community, someone will pay out, you know, two or three grand for a pistol and then completely skimp on a trauma kit. Like I, yeah. I don't, I, I get it. I get it. You know, trauma kits, yeah. they're not as sexy. That's right. no problem. But, you know, if you do anything dangerous long enough, you are eventually going to have a problem. You're eventually going to get injured. So um, having something available to take care of yourself is going to be essential because we want to be able to keep doing what we love. You know, yeah. we want to keep mountain biking and using those $8,000 bikes. So <laughs> the best way to do that is make sure you have a little bit of insurance, keep yourself alive until you get off the mountain. Yep, Exactly. Right on, Brian. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, again, I'll, I'll include links uh, in the, the posts uh, that I do for this. Um, you know, but make sure everybody go to mountainmanmedical.com and check out the tracker. Uh, that is the name of the trauma kit that he was showing earlier. And I think that's a really great place for people to start. It's, uh, well, like, you know, 80 bucks or something like that. I mean, it's less than a hundred dollars. I forget. I'm not good with the prices. I just do. Yeah. The, I, I, uh, yeah, cause I, I, yeah. Looking at it, I'm, I'm pretty like, I, I'm pretty sure uh, that it's like, it's less than a hundred dollars, which is like, holy crap. Like what, what a deal really to have all those tools uh, that can help people if, if you need it. So go and check that out, go check, do their, their free training course, at least do that. So you guys have the knowledge. Um, but yeah, man, a lot of great info in today's podcast. I appreciate you taking the time uh, for joining me. Absolutely. I had a blast. I'd love to come back on. Awesome, Brian. Yeah, we will. Uh, I'll find an excuse to get you on for sure. So <laughs> cool. Well, I'm going to uh, stop recording here. And uh, so, yeah, everybody, this has been uh, James Wilson. Check me out at bikejames.com. And I will talk to everybody next time.